No matter where in the world you are, the language of COVID-19 is the same. It's the language of... War. In a true sense, we're at war. War against COVID-19. We are fighting a bit of a battle, even a war. We're all in a war against COVID-19 together. And in this war, we're told we have a... Horrible, invisible enemy. This invisible enemy. This invisible enemy we have an is invisible just an invisible enemy. We have an invisible enemy. But to say we are in the midst of a war against an invisible enemy is not quite right. We know what this enemy looks like, and it's something like this. And knowing that is key to understanding how we can use our weapons against it. The virus has weaknesses and across the world teams of scientists are working to exploit them in different ways. To understand those weaknesses, you first need to understand a bit about how the virus functions and how your cells react. One of the things to remember about viruses is that they can't function outside of a host cell. Potential host cells are particularly available in our throat and lungs and how the virus gets into them is down to its structure and their structure. So, I mean, this virus is effectively imagine it like a tennis ball with spikes. So it has a kind of a fatty layer on the outside and then it has all these little proteins, these little knobbly bits on the outside that we call spikes. The SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein sits on the outside of, of the virus particle and it interacts with, the, um, with a protein on the surface of the cell called the ACE2 receptor. If the ACE2 receptor is the lock, the spike protein is the key. There's another thing in our cell which acts like a door handle and between them they allow the virus to merge and the important bits to enter the cell. The important bits are the bits that allow the virus to replicate and the most important bit is the bit called the RNA. So as soon as they, it produces this RNA, the host cell machinery kicks it into place and basically the virus takes over that machinery and then pumps out all of the proteins it needs for its replication cycle. That cycle is what creates more virus. It involves the interaction between the RNA and a thing called the polymerase. That polymerase is able to bind onto virus RNA um, and effectively act like a photocopier. So it will read the RNA and make copies of it. All of these different copies are then um, packaged into new virus particles. So those new virus particles can then spread to other cells and then can also spread to other people as well. But our cells don't just allow this to happen, they fight. And if there's a real war to talk about, it begins here. One of the first things infected cells do is alert nearby cells to the attack, calling immediately for help from others in the immune system. Some of these uh, proteins, cytokines, chemokines, we call them all interference stimulated genes, are capable of interacting directly with the virus and therefore attacking the virus, the replication machinery. That battle builds up over several days, reaching a peak when the body's cellular artillery arrives. So that's your T cells and your B cells. And they're the real heavies that start coming in after maybe five or six days of the infection happening. The B cells are the guys that produce antibodies. The T cells, once activated, roam around the body, identify infected cells and destroy those infected cells. Because of course, infected cells have now become factories for producing virus. In 80% of cases, our cells win out. But for others, the immune system begins to fear it's being overwhelmed. It panics and begins firing blindly, hoping to hit some or any virus. Instead of it happening in a controlled way to identify the virus and neutralize it, the immune response is disproportional and it's the immune response that then starts to cause um, a lot of the damage. The immune system gets overactive and that's where you start to get this um, damage to the tissue. That cell damage can leave us open to other types of infection and our lungs unable to function properly, requiring ventilation. That's why one of the first things scientists are working on is a drug that will calm the right parts of the immune system when it begins to panic. If we can identify a drug that doesn't interfere 
with the other adaptive immune response, our hope is that we will not impact on the, the development of good protective immunity, but we will have a very significant impact on the inflammatory response. That would help severe cases, but the wider aim is to find a drug that will do something to prevent cases becoming so severe in the first place. They're called antiviral drugs, hundreds are being looked at, each trying to do something slightly different to stop the virus from beating our cells. The main way that viruses are, are, are being targeted is um, by targeting the polymerase. So the polymerase will grab onto the viral RNA and it'll trundle along it um, and make copies of it. And if you can inhibit it some way um, or block it from working, you ideally stop the virus from replicating or making copies of itself. Effectively act like a paper jam. A lot of hope is being placed currently in remdesivir, an antiviral originally developed to fight Ebola. It's aimed at the polymerase, but that's not the only perceived weak spot. Some of them are stopping the virus binding to the receptor, so the ACE2 receptor. Some are binding directly to the virus particle, and, um, and preventing that interaction. Um, and others are blocking the step that allows the membrane of the virus particle to fuse with the membrane of the cell. All involve complex chemical processes and require good clinical trials, but there is hope among scientists. And then beyond the drug, there's the vaccine. There's 70 or so of them being developed. Some involve weakening the virus before injecting it. The virus is really good at taking over the cell and defending itself against the cellular immune response. If we can take the RNA and remove the defense genes from the virus, then we can put back in the virus into the body, but now suddenly it has no ability to defend itself against the immune response. So structurally, it look, it'll look exactly like a real virus, but because it can't defend itself against the immune system, the immune system will win every time. Others involve things like growing the spike protein on a virus particle our bodies already know how to fight. And the final truly modern approach involves cutting up the RNA of the virus and isolating just the part that makes the spike protein and getting that into our cells. They're called RNA vaccines and the technology to make them only became viable in the last five years or so. All they need to do now is just deliver the RNA into the cell in an intact manner and now the cell will take over the mRNA and start producing tons of that protein just like what would happen in a situation where the virus is infecting the cell. The big difference is that now you don't have all of the rest of the virus to worry about nor the rest of the viral genome. Many people in the worlds of medical science believe RNA vaccines will be a key weapon in fighting pandemics in the coming years. The problem is none have been approved yet. Testing will be crucial. But they're just one of various weapons being designed, built, trialled and assessed in this war. A war that's being fought at incredible pace and one scientists are sure they will win. But a war against an enemy we're still learning about day by day and battle by battle.